Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Sue Onslow, currently Director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and it's my pleasure to start the proceedings today. So I would like to extend a welcome to uh, Your Excellency, esteemed colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen. It is a delight to be able to welcome people back here to Senate House to an event to discuss, is the Commonwealth working? It feels as if it's been a very long two years, and I can just feel the energy and appreciation of the opportunity for all of us to get together and to network yet again. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with my colleagues, uh, Stuart Mull and Dr. Alex May. Um, Stuart, of course, is chair currently of the Commonwealth Association. Alex is the absolute mainspring of the round table, in which Stuart is also um, an active um, contributor, and also the Commonwealth Foundation. So um, our thanks to our fellow collaborators uh, for putting on this event, and also I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to SAS events team, who have been terrific in helping with today's organization. I just have to say two points of housekeeping before I invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Wendy Thompson, to make her opening remarks. The first of which is that there is no scheduled fire alarm today, so if the fire alarm goes off, please take it seriously and follow the exit signs over there. The second is that the facilities, the ladies and the gents, is all on this floor, just through the double doors and on the right-hand side. So with that, I would like to open today's proceedings uh, to say that I believe this to be a very exciting event, a very timely event, and I hope that what will come out of it are also not simply comments from critical friends, but also recommendations for how the Commonwealth um, can and should move forward in, at multiple levels and in multiple ways. So with that, I'd like to welcome Prof uh, Professor Wendy Thompson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sue. Welcome to everyone uh, here in the room uh, at Senate House, but also uh, online. Uh, it's, we're in that moment uh, that we've learned to live in, where we can be in multiple realities uh, simultaneously. So uh, it's great to be able to do that, especially at an event of this kind. Um, we're very proud of Senate House, so it is nice to have people actually here face to face. They, as Sue has said, it's uh, been a couple of years since we've been able to do this, but these events, uh, I think have been a tradition running up to Shogham, having a discussion and a regular feature uh, at Senate House um, until, you know, it's, as you know, they've been postponed but due to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, allow me to add uh, my welcome to Sue's really to say what a pleasure it is to have people uh, face to face here uh, at, at this room. Those of you who are historians will know there's many, uh, many stories to be told about Senate House and if you have time to uh, to have a wander around or even ask uh, people to give you some ideas of some of the stories, uh, I'm sure they'd be very proud to tell you about it. Um, there's not, there's certainly uh, stories of, uh, of the Ministry of Information, uh, you know, if you wanted to know where misinformation uh, began, I think it may have started here, uh, but it wasn't the university's doing, I can assure you. Um, although there are t tales of ghosts in Senate House, so some of them have been spotted in the library, I'm told. Um, certainly one in my office, which features late at night. Anyway, it's, it's a great building and we are very proud of it and very happy to welcome you to it here today. The role of international uh, organizations is very much uh, in the public eye at the moment. I don't think there's ever been more of an important job to be played by international organizations when we look around the world and see the turbulence uh, and, the, and the leadership challenges that, that, that we observe. And the job has probably rarely been more difficult than it is at the moment. So an organization like the uh, Commonwealth, with its history uh, and its membership, you know, has a very important role to play. These events, you know, can have a certain, uh, of, like Shogun, uh, can have a sort of set piece to them, um, and uh, that can perhaps lead us to wonder what they really deliver uh, for the people in the countries that are affiliated to, to the Commonwealth. Uh, and, you know, inevitably we'll, we'll observe, I'm sure, at, at Kigali, those sort of uh, photo shows, uh, summitry sort of uh, celebrations. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I think it, it's, it's upon us and, and the Institute here at the University to really, you know, expect more than just the, the, 
celebration and the, uh, the, the you know the, the sort of formal events of these sorts of uh, of occasions. We need to see and and really what what can be done with this uh, uh, organization and the people in it to change the lives for the better of the people uh, in, in in the Commonwealth. Um, and I have to say that this is relevant to other international organizations as it is to the Commonwealth. I think we could ask similar questions to the United Nations, the European Union, you know, so many uh, of our international organizations. These, this international governance remains critical. Whatever changes may be being observed in the way that globalization is being restructured, rechanged, and perhaps interrupted uh, as a result of the pandemic and other, uh, other economic uh, events, but nevertheless still critical to have some form of international governance. So they're, they're, they're tough questions that uh, those of us who value the Commonwealth uh, need to ask, uh, and those of us who I think believe in uh, cooperation, international cooperation and multilateralism. Uh, so here we are today, uh, you know, asking the hard questions, you know, is the Commonwealth working? I mean, you could ask that question about a lot of things, uh, uh, probably a lot of institutions, uh, but here today we're thinking about the Commonwealth. Um, and I guess I mean, I've always been on the side of trying to make things work, so I guess it, it's also a place to think about, you know, what needs to happen to make it work better, and what small part can we play uh, in institutions such as this to bring uh, about some of those more positive changes. So the organizers of this one-day uh, conference, uh, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and the Roundtable, in partnership with the Commonwealth Foundation and the Commonwealth Association, I think are really well placed to gather together the best people with knowledge and expertise across the Commonwealth to assess the question and, and doing so across a range of themes. Uh, I'm sure there'll be no one right answer um, and probably no one answer at all, but many different views and, and that's the opportunity that a one-day conference of this kind provides. Um, and I hope that the audience today in the room and, and online will play a full part in the debate and take us to a closer understanding of uh, what to, not only what to expect in, at King Galley, but what we might hope uh, to be done arising from it and going into the future. Um, for our part, I think the university uh, would like the institute to be, to be playing an active role in these debates uh, and to facilitate uh, the kind of uh, informed discussion, bringing forward evidence, ideas to strengthen the Commonwealth and uh, to see what we can do in a, in a small way uh, to make it work. Uh, I think, as I've said, it's never been a more important for, moment for organizations like the Commonwealth uh, to do so. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I'm a member of, uh, of, I guess, of a Commonwealth country, so I have some kind of uh, uh, skin in the game, so to speak. And, and I did get invited to the, the palace when all forces were mobilized in the UK to bring out Commonwealth representatives uh, at the last Trogum in London uh, when uh, the leadership was under question. I think it was, I was the best they could find in Norfolk as a common, <laughs> where I was working at the time to be a, a Commonwealth citizen. Um, I'm sure other parts of the UK did rather better, but I did my best, and nevertheless, and uh, I was proud to be able to associate with such a such a, a, a grand occasion. So good luck today. I hope it's a great discussion. Uh, thank you for allowing me to meet you and greet you today. I'd like to invite um, Mr. Amitabh Banerjee, who is going to be chairing the, the first session, and speakers to come up and speak from the front. Good morning. Uh, I'm a short person as well. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for that warm welcome and for your important words. Uh, and thank you also to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and its acting head for hosting us here. Um, it is a wonderful feeling indeed, as she said, to have the ability to see people in person and uh, to have so many old friends here. So thank you very much for that as well. My name is Amitabh Banerjee. Um, I started my career as, as an Indian diplomat, but then spent 25 years at Marlborough House as a Commonwealth civil servant. Uh, and I now work for something called the Global Leadership Foundation uh, which brings together 45 retired leaders from around the world, 11, 11 of them from the Commonwealth. Um, I was born after the modern Commonwealth came into being in 1948. Uh, but if I were an adult then, 
uh, and if I were a betting man, uh, I would probably not have put money on the prospect that 65 years later the Commonwealth would be so still flourishing. Uh, this is because there was something uh, quite inherently problematic in the proposition that uh, former colonies, many of whom had felt the sharp edge of the colonial yoke, could come into a voluntary and constructive association with the erstwhile colonial power and uh, even accept its head of state, albeit symbolically, as the head of this new association. Uh, the fact that six and a half decades later the Commonwealth is still alive and kicking is due to many factors. And one of the most powerful factors clearly is that it is not just a network of member governments, but a much wider network, and indeed a, a network of networks. Apart from governments, uh, both national and local, it is also a network of parliaments. It is a network of businesses uh, trying to capitalize on the famous Commonwealth premium. It is a network of young people. It is a network of sports persons who compete every few years in the Commonwealth Games. And very importantly, it is a network of civil society organizations. Uh, when I was in the Secretariat, some 90 organizations had the Commonwealth in their names. Uh, I don't know if that number has grown. Uh, it is easy to understate the many, many professional streams that are so brought together, be it magistrates and judges, be it lawyers, uh, be it human rights organizations, the media, architects, planners, tax administrators, universities, etc., etc. To stay in sync with the title of this conference, um, are these networks working? Well, my microphone clearly <laughs> is not in cooperative mode. Um, if so, what is the winning formula for a successful network in the Commonwealth? And if not, what is the deficiency? And as the Vice Chancellor said, what can be done to make things work better? I think she also touched on a very, very important issue, which is not just is the Commonwealth working, but is multilateralism working? It is a question being asked every day today, for example, about the United Nations, which seems so utterly helpless and impotent in view of what is happening in Ukraine. Um, it works beautifully in, in other areas of cooperation, and you still need multilateralism, but is multilateralism working? But today our focus is, is the Commonwealth working? To explore these questions, we have a stellar cast. Uh, you've already seen the bios, but I will briefly introduce each panelist before they speak, after which each has been requested to speak for 10 to 15 minutes. So the, um, and thereafter, we'll go to Q&A and have a, hopefully a free-flowing and broadly representative discussion. And I will rely on the technical support of our organizing team to try and ensure that uh, as many of those attending online can also participate as fully as possible. So the first speaker on my list is Dr. Anne Gallagher, uh, Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation. She has had an illustrious career with the United Nations and with ASEAN, uh, including a special advisor to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights at that time, Mary Robinson. She's also a lawyer and a teacher. Over to you, Anne. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I might stand up just, uh, and even though I'm also a bit short, I've got hard shoes on, so I'm going to adjust the microphone as well. And I just wanted to begin by saying how lovely it is to be uh, with everyone today. I think everyone who stands up is going to say the same thing. It's so nice to see people, isn't it? Even if they look so different in, uh, <laughs> in real life. Yeah, I think there's been a few double takes. I'm not, uh, I'm going to have to do something with my Zoom thing. Uh, yeah, anyway, so I really appreciate the efforts of Sue and everyone to bring us together. It's especially at this time, uh, yeah, for some of the reasons that I'll go into in my remarks. So I've been asked to focus my remarks on networks, on the power of human and institutional connections to weave the web that must shape and contain our modern commonwealth. But like every rogue lawyer, I can't resist the temptation of straying a bit beyond my brief. So 
I will also perhaps say a few things about some of the big issues and worries that I know are on all of our minds, not least our collective unease about the future of this organisation that we all love. So many of you are Commonwealth veterans. I'm looking at the chair, I'm looking at Sue, I'm looking at my fabulous predecessor, Vijay, who's in the back row there. Uh, so many of you are veterans who are going to be able to bring much more context and much more insight to this discussion than I ever could. As a long-serving UN official, the Commonwealth was always something of a mystery to me, uh, and that remained the case when I joined just about three years ago now. Since then, I've really come to appreciate the strength and complexity of this unique organisation, a grouping of very different states that would rarely find themselves in such close proximity, particularly in the United Nations, in my old setting. A grouping that extends in unusual ways that we're going to be talking about in this session to include the people that make up those states. So as you uh, all know from, from the introduction, I'm here as in my capacity as Director General of the Foundation. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Foundation at all except to uh, make a remark about its significance to the issues and concerns that bring us together uh, here today. The Commonwealth is, to my knowledge, the only intergovernmental grouping in existence to have created an agency explicitly mandated to advance the interests of civil society. So by establishing their own organisation in support of civil society, member states accept that the people they serve, the 2.5 billion citizens of the Commonwealth, are entitled to a voice. They accept that the business of governance is not theirs alone, that a strong and flourishing civil space is evidence of a healthy and a prosperous civil community, uh, country. Now, like the UN's own founding document, our charter begins with those fine and stirring words, we the people. But unlike the UN, the Commonwealth has taken this pretty radical idea one step further, many steps further, and not just through the foundation, through that tapestry of personal and institutional connections that bind people and societies together. In my 30 years, uh, that's a bit of a shock, in my 30 years as an international civil servant, I've never actually seen anything quite like that. Of course, we all know that things are not perfect within the networks, and I'm speaking now, my, my next remarks are really about the formal networks that are comprised of the accredited organisations. It's hard to escape the view that too much of our networking, way too much of our thinking about the future of the Commonwealth takes place here in London. That too much of our networking and thinking involves an old guard that may not have done enough to nurture the next generation of Commonwealth leaders and champions. That the networks themselves are still not sufficiently inclusive of the broader Commonwealth that we all aspire to. And those imperfections extend to the relationship between the formal networks and the intergovernmental pillars of the Commonwealth. Our accredited organisations are often uh, and rightly frustrated with their inability to engage meaningfully and consistently with the Secretariat and through the Secretariat with Member States. And the withdrawal of foundation funding, I think almost a decade ago now, funding that allowed many of them to keep their heads barely above water has left a bitter and persistent legacy. From my position at the foundation, I see a need for action on both fronts. The Commonwealth's non-governmental or quasi-governmental entities must begin to act more as a network. They must work harder and more cleverly to make this network truly reflective of the Commonwealth and indispensable to the Commonwealth's effective functioning. Now, of course, so much good work is already happening on that front, and I do want to recognise real progress and real achievement. I speak here of the quotidian labour of the nurses and the midwives, the planners and parliamentarians, the universities and journalists, 
those who are looking out for the interests of young Commonwealth citizens, old Commonwealth citizens, those with a disability, those suffering because of discrimination and stigma, all of these organisations are engaged in work that reaps real results in terms of impact on people's lives. And certainly the networks have demonstrated a capacity, uh, if a little bit uneven, to unite around a common cause on some issues and media freedom is a good recent example. The network's been able to spring into action, launching a spirited defence against what we all know is a really serious erosion of fundamental Commonwealth values. But the network could certainly be much stronger, much more united and definitely much more strategic. To take another recent example, I feel strongly that it could have been much louder in expressing its bitter disappointment at the failure of the Commonwealth to demonstrate solidarity when lives depended on it. I'm speaking here, of course, about the failure of the Commonwealth to do anything meaningful in securing access to vaccines for vulnerable Commonwealth communities, something that was so possible and that just didn't happen. On another matter, a united network could be a powerful force to protect and defend the interests of the Commonwealth's small island states when it comes to existential threats they're facing from climate change. Of course, many Commonwealth organisations are doing valuable work on this issue, but we all know that the real power of networks lies in their amplifying effect, and that this is where more work can and should be done. We also have to work on the relationship between the network and members of the network and the Commonwealth intergovernmental institutions. That relationship has to be based on a clear acknowledgement of our very different roles. And these roles will mean that our paths are not always going to be perfectly aligned. That's just the way it is. For example, while the foundation exists to advance the aspirations and needs of the people of the Commonwealth, we're not an NGO. We must bring our member states and governments along with us. That's the only way we can work. They're vital to our mission and to its success. So the different roles that the networks and the intergovernmental structures occupy should be a source of strength, not a cause for division and dilution of impact. The common cause is there and it must become part of our collective vision. Colleagues, are here or will be here from the Secretariat and I'll leave it to them to talk about how the Secretariat is working to support and nurture Commonwealth values, uh, networks and connections. Speaking for the Foundation, I can acknowledge the lingering frustrations around withdrawn funding while being open with all of you that that old model of support is absolutely gone forever. It's never going to return. The world moves on and we need to as well. But for me, that just means looking for more and better ways to engage. I've seen over the past couple of years how much can be done when we work with accredited organisations as true partners. Our Critical Conversation Series, which is reaching literally hundreds of thousands of Commonwealth citizens, has brought big ideas that matter to the Commonwealth, to, to the people of the Commonwealth. This couldn't have happened without the support and advice that we've received from, it would have been much poorer, let's say, without that support and input from the organisations represented here. I can say the same for the People's Forum and for so much more of what we do together. And as the defender and advocate of Commonwealth Civil Society, the Foundation sees itself as your champion, as a champion of the network and of the networks. This is why we publicly called out the draft Chogham communique for its failure, its abject failure to adequately recognise the role of civil society in advancing Commonwealth ideals and principles. This is why we've been so vocal on issues that you're also fighting for. This is why we've been so open in helping to use our platforms to amplify the work that you're doing. I look forward to more of that. I believe that you can demand more of your intergovernmental partners while also demanding more of yourselves. So, fellow friends of the Commonwealth, I'm coming to an end now. I did time it. It seems that 
our beloved organisation fairly regularly finds itself at a crossroads. It may be the case that in a decade's time we will look back and marvel at what a good and solid path we were on in May to 2022, uh, less than a month out from the most successful Chogham ever, an event that served to reinvigorate the Commonwealth to loudly and clearly affirm its continued relevance to the people of the Commonwealth and the wider world. But in 10 years' time, we might also look back in sorrow, wishing that we'd been braver, wishing we'd been louder in our defence of Commonwealth values and ideals, wishing that we had recognised and leaned into what turned out to be a pivotal moment in our common history, wishing we'd seen the signs of a precarious but, but debilitated alliance occupying a tenuous space in an increasingly fractured and divided world. And this is where I want to come back to our networks. Reinvigoration and reform of the Commonwealth, the task of making the Commonwealth fit for purpose and the task of working out what that purpose needs to be is something that must occupy us all. If we believe this is an organisation that belongs to the people, not just to the member states, it is us and our organisations that must stand up and become part of the solution. We need to point out what's wrong Absolutely. But we also need to work together and with member states to figure out what to do about it. The organisation organisers very cleverly asked the panellists to put forward some practical ideas. I'd like to propose that next year, the 10 year anniversary of the Charter of the Commonwealth, we establish a new eminent persons group to take stock of where we are and where we need to go. So much has changed since 2011 and it's time to use that first report not as a roadmap, but as a springboard for creating a new vision of the Commonwealth, a forward-looking vision that's shaped by the people and the member states together, a vision that is firmly directed towards the principles and values of the Charter. So that's my single idea for change. I'm sure many more ideas are going to emerge today, but let's resolve to take the best ones forward, to do what we can to individually and together be brave in our defence of the Commonwealth and its ideals, to fight for a Commonwealth that is really a force to be reckoned with on the world stage, a Commonwealth that shapes global policy on issues that matter most to the people, a Commonwealth that is united in defending the most vulnerable, including its smallest member states. So someone once said that Pessimists are usually right and optimists are usually wrong, but all of the great changes have been accomplished by optimists. So let's sign up to be optimists about, of our Commonwealth. Let's commit to doing the work that we all know uh, just has to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne, uh, for your eloquent and stirring words. Uh, your reminder that Commonwealth values are backsliding and under threat. Your reminder that civil society must not fear to raise its voice. And you play a very critical role in being a bridge between Commonwealth governments and civil society, because having all those govern government representatives around your board table and being able to reflect the views of the many organizations that are trying to supplement and as you say amplify the voice of the commonwealth uh, is, a, is, a, is a very key one uh, you also rightly said don't just be critical be constructive and i commend you for the idea that you just put forward yourself for an epg to mark the 10th anniversary of the Commonwealth Charter next year. I'd even forgotten that it's coming up to 10 years. So thank you very much, and I'm sure there'll be further discussion that is triggered by your, by your intervention, your statement. Um, our next speaker is Indrajit Kumar Swami, who is going to be joining us on Zoom, and I will transfer myself there in a moment to be able to see him. Uh, he's an old friend and comrade in arms, um, not just of mine, but many of you in this room. He um, 
who was Director of Economic Affairs of the Secretariat and also Deputy Head of the Secretary General's Office. His latest claim to fame was as Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And I'm sure he will forgive me for saying that Sri Lanka today terribly misses his wisdom and expertise. Um, in fact, one reason he was not able to join us in person is that because he is involved in critical virtual negotiations on trying to rescue Sri Lanka from its current predicament. Indrajit, if you can hear me, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Amitabh. I hope uh, everyone can hear and see me. Um, if that is the case, I will uh, proceed. Thank you very much. I, I, I must thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm sorry, uh, unlike uh, other speakers, I'm not able to say uh, what a pleasure it is to see everybody in person. Um, but uh, still, it's, a, it's wonderful to have the opportunity uh, to greet uh, so many old colleagues and friends, uh, both uh, uh, at the site uh, and virtually. I'm going to slightly um, shift the uh, theme of my remarks uh, and pick up on something that Sue Onslow said in her opening remarks and to focus on where the Commonwealth can and should move forward. So it's going to be a somewhat more forward-looking perspective uh, than implied in the, in the actual title uh, of the event. Uh, before identifying four or five areas where the Commonwealth can and should uh, move forward. Um, let me make a few introductory remarks. Um, clearly, it's critical um, that the Commonwealth is well um, resourced uh, and has well designed programs. And while the whole networks, uh, the series of networks that makes up the Commonwealth uh, family um, requires support, I think it is particularly important for the intergovernmental arm, the Commonwealth Secretariat, to be well-resourced and have well-designed programs. Because when the Secretariat is working well, it is able to catalyze activity around the whole of the network of, uh, of the Commonwealth family. Uh, it has a kind of amplifying effect. Um, so it's important that the Secretariat is well-resourced. And within that, having spent 20 years working on the, on the development pillar of the Secretariat, I'm going to put in a, a rather strong plug for a resourcing of development activity within the Commonwealth. Uh, in my view, for the Commonwealth to remain relevant, it is important that it has a strong development program. I suspect if the, if the um, importance and, and quality of the development activity within the Commonwealth uh, recedes, it's likely that the level of interest um, that a number of Commonwealth member countries have in the association is likely to wane. Um, and in, in saying this, I must say that it is also in the interest of the political pillar of the Commonwealth's work to have a strong development arm. I say this because if one focuses a little bit on the nexus between the development and political activities of the Commonwealth, you will, I think in my view, it is possible to make the case that the, the, the Commonwealth's ability to do it, some of its very important political work, like the Secretary General's Good Office's role, uh, strengthening uh, democracy um, uh, and governance institutions in member countries. The Secretariat is able to perform effectively in these areas because of the trust that countries, member countries have in the Commonwealth as a, as, as a trusted partner. And this um, perception of the Secretariat or the Commonwealth being a, a trusted partner comes from, I believe, the position that the Commonwealth has consistently taken on major development issues over the years. From the time of Sashudat Ramfar through all several other Secretaries General, the Commonwealth has consistently taken a strongly um, developmental position on several major international economic issues. And I think the trust that uh, member countries have in the Commonwealth stems from this. In fact, over the 20 years that I worked in the Secretariat, on numerable occasions, um, representatives of member governments have told me, you know, we feel the Commonwealth is on our side, that the Commonwealth is seated on our side of the table. 
And that is what I think uh, gives us the space to do quite a lot of our political work as well. So it's in the interest of both the uh, development and political uh, spheres for the development work of the Secretariat to be well designed and, and, very, and well resourced. Let me now try and identify a few areas where I think uh, the Commonwealth can move forward as far as development activity is concerned. And, and, and first to pick up on the theme of multilateralism, about which um, previous speakers have already uh, uh, made certain remarks. Um, you know, as, as others have said, we are living in a world where there is a steady erosion of multilateralism. Uh, there's an increasing salience uh, of regionalism that we're seeing around the world. Uh, and this process has been invigorated uh, in, in recent times by the effort at what is being termed decoupling, which is code for really basically a decoupling from the Chinese economy. And, and this process is now being further reinforced uh, by uh, fracturing that is taking place as a result of the Ukraine war. Now, obviously the Commonwealth is not in a position to resolve major, issue, the major issues um, related to multilateralism. However, as a microcosm of the world, with the presence um, in all the continents, it is able to provide a conducive platform or a comfortable space for inter-regional uh, contacts, which can improve understanding. I, uh, one clear example that I can recall from the past is when the ACP countries were negotiating with the EU um, and the Secretariat was able to bring together trade representatives from the different three different regions of the Commonwealth to uh, meet together so that they could forge common positions uh, in their negotiations with the European unions. And I think that was particularly helpful for them. And this is the kind of platform that the Secretariat can provide in helping to develop consensus on some issues. I, I think one should be comfortable in one's skin and not overreach and realize that there are limitations as to what one can do um, on these matters. Uh, but. Uh, I think there is an opportunity to be had to use the Commonwealth's global reach uh, and, and the diversity of its membership to um, play a role in, as I said, creating a comfortable space for people to talk to each other. The second area is climate change. Now here, again, uh, the Commonwealth has a formidable track record. I think it was in, at a Chogam in 1985 that President Gayoum of the Maldives first talked about sea level, sea level rise affecting his country. And shortly after that, there was a Commonwealth Expert Group. And in 1989, there was the Lankawi Declaration. Um, so even before the Rio summit in 1991, the Commonwealth had started working on issues, important issues related to climate change. And since then, it has been um, engaged in various uh, issues related to climate change. And going forward, given the importance of the issue, I think here again, the Commonwealth can play an important role uh, in one, uh, maybe uh, auditing the outcomes uh, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, COP, uh, the Glasgow COP26, uh, to see whether from the perspective of small and vulnerable economies, uh, the commitments are being met and then help to, and use this analysis to help to shape the uh, Cairo COP27 uh, uh, meetings. Um, and, and I think, again, uh, this is an area where, as you know, there are conflicting interests, um, winners and losers uh, in, in various ways. And again, the Commonwealth can play a role in helping uh, to build consensus. Um, thirdly, um, the managing director of the IMF has said that over 60 countries are likely to be confronted with debt distress. This is again an area where the Commonwealth has a very strong track record. Uh, in fact, it, in the 1990s, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was the 1980s again, where Nigel Lawson first mooted the, um, the, the initial um, package of measures to provide uh, debt relief for um, low-income countries. 
he first um, trialed it at a Commonwealth Finance Minister's meeting in Barbados and subsequently took it to the Toronto G7 Summit and what became known as the Toronto Terms, were actually um, first, as I said, uh, um, introduced at a Commonwealth Finance Minister's meeting. And, and subsequently uh, at, a, at a meeting in Mauritius, uh, again, uh, I think John Major was the Chancellor of the Exchequer then, uh, he introduced uh, what became eventually became the HIPIC initiative. So the Secretariat has a very strong record, a track record in this area. It is able to articulate the interests of those countries which are now are being confronted with increasing debt distress. Um, and uh, I think, again, it's something uh, that there is a demonstrated uh, comparative advantage uh, from, the, from the past which needs to be built upon uh, going forward. Um, another area uh, I, I see uh, uh, um, Sir Donald uh, in, in the audience, he will remember this very well. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, Uruguay, the, um, the WTO ministerial meeting is around the corner. Uh, of course, it's too late to influence the agenda as such, uh, but having a close eye on what comes out of the meeting um, uh, would be useful to see whether there can be a, a, a Commonwealth initiative like the Commonwealth uh, um, Trade Minister's mission uh, that went around uh, to the key capitals, to, uh, to Brussels, to Washington, to, uh, to Tokyo, um, to basically um, advocate on behalf of uh, the developing countries particularly the vulnerable, small and vulnerable economies, uh, whose voice sometimes is not uh, heard as loudly uh, as it should be. Uh, and so uh, I think the Uruguay round, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, the Doha round negotiations have been at an impasse now for a long time. It is probably not the right environment right now in the world uh, to get that uh, going again, but there could be elements of the um, Doha round agenda, which could be hived off and pushed forward towards uh, some kind of conclusion. For instance, the agreement on trade facilitation was reached. Um, it was taken out of the, um, the, whole, the full agenda and, and pushed forward. Similarly, aid for trade is one area where there could be movement, particularly at a time uh, given the, the um, the hostile global environment and the need for increased resource transfers that many developing countries are, are face, uh, confronted with, that taking aid for trade and pushing it forward could be one way of um, assisting countries in this, time, in this time of great need. So to see what's coming out of the Uruguay round, to see whether one can use uh, tried and trusted uh, modalities uh, to make sure that the interests of the most vulnerable uh, members of the Commonwealth uh, are uh, articulated uh, and there is strong advocacy around their positions. The fourth area is the restructuring of global supply chains. Um, you know, uh, the pandemic highlighted the need for resilience in supply chains, and this has now uh, driven um, companies to rethink uh, their supply chains, and that process is being uh, reinforced or accelerated uh, by geopolitical tensions. And so with this significant trend that we are seeing towards shifting uh, of investment uh, and, and, and the, the relocation of supply chains, there are opportunities and challenges. Uh, and here I think the Commonwealth is well-placed to do uh, both analytical and advocacy work to help Commonwealth countries uh, to benefit from this. And here, I think the uh, Commonwealth Business Council, I, I, I believe it's now called the Commonwealth Trade and Enterprise Council, I hope I've got that right, uh, can play a, a particularly useful role. It's important that they don't um, become too UK-centric uh, and that, that that should be a, a, a broad-based interest, uh, which takes into account the full cross-section of the Commonwealth membership. But this, again, is an area where the Commonwealth, I feel, can play a role. And finally, food and energy security. I think for some years in, uh, in the future, we are going to have challenges as far as food and energy security is concerned. 
Uh, and the most vulnerable countries within the Commonwealth are likely to be most challenged in this area. And I think that this is an area where the Commonwealth can again do sound analysis, uh, develop uh, robust advocacy uh, to help countries uh, to make the case uh, for, um, for improving their food and energy security. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Amitav. Thank you very much, Indrajit, uh, and, and thank you for reminding us that development must remain absolutely central to policy issues in the Commonwealth, that the vast majority of Commonwealth countries are developing countries, um, and that important though fundamental political values are, uh, I am reminded of a remark that a certain foreign minister made to me many years ago. Uh, to the effect that, yes, we'll do our best, but you cannot eat human rights. Um, I think you've flagged the importance of the many networks that exist in the intergovernmental commonwealth to push development issues, such as indebtedness, such as climate change, such as trade. And you've flagged uh, a very, very crucial crisis that is looming upon the world as a whole which is food and energy security, so exacerbated by the latest international situation. Um, one handicap we face here is that we can't see everybody who is on Zoom. Uh, I was delighted to note that uh, my former boss, Sir Don McKinnon, is um, attending this. And uh, I'd like to say hello to him specially, but also to the many others whom I know are attending online. So thanks again, Indrajit. Um, I turn now to John Davis, um, CEO of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's United Kingdom branch. He is a British career diplomat, um, and as part of his many important duties, he headed the UK's Diplomatic Training Academy. Uh, he now plays a very important role in shepherding uh, UK parliamentarians and promoting their contributions to key policy issues. Uh, as well as their collaboration with their peers in other Commonwealth countries. Over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, whether you're here or online. Uh, and thank you, Amitabh, for that introduction. I am, yes, another recovering diplomat, um, so, uh, but no longer a member of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, so I can speak <coughs> without that burden today. What I will speak of, as Amitav says, is as the Chief Executive of the UK branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Uh, and I know that Stephen Twigg uh, would also, I think, very much like to have been involved today. He's on a plane back from Australia at the moment, having been there uh, with their Parliamentary Academy's latest uh, event. Uh, Vice-Chancellor, it's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, in person at the University of London. Thank you for having us, and thank you to Sue and all the various organisations you've made today possible. <clears throat> I'm not going to try to start at least with as broad a sweep as both Anne and Indrajit have managed. Uh, forgive me if I may, to start with deliberately narrowing in to try to answer the question, is the Commonwealth working? By looking at parochially some of the work we do, it's not a promotion for what we do, but using it as a, as a one of the case study of what can work about the networks of the Commonwealth and then trying to expand out from that a little bit about what that might tell us uh, about how we make the Commonwealth uh, work better. So I'll look a little bit about how, how it works, uh, the challenges of when it doesn't or why it's hard to make it work and then uh, as we've been instructed and asked some ideas about how to, uh, practical ideas to take that forward. So. The Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, whether it's the UK branch or any other, is partly about networks, and it, but it should be, and certainly from the UK point of view, it's designed to strengthen parliaments, to make our own and other parliaments as good as they can be at what they are supposed to do. Uh, and it very much, I don't know about shepherding UK parliamentarians, I would hesitate, that probably is what we do sometimes physically, but actually it is supposed to be helping them and people who work in 
uh, our parliament as much as any other parliament to be learning from each other across the Commonwealth. And I think when it works, uh, it's when it's really practical. It's, it's some, sometimes, about, this is the quotidian work, I think, if I heard Anne correctly, uh, that our and many other organizations are doing. It's, it's very practical and it's from a tried and trusted and expert network. And I think that's the key of it. So for the overall CPA, for example, the work that Stephen Twigg has been involved with in uh, Sydney in Australia at the New South Wales Parliament, uh, is part of the new Parliamentary Academy which CPA has set up, which is uh, an online resource with occasional in-person events. Uh, and it works because it brings together people who uh, know something about how parliaments work or should work and brings them together to learn from each other uh, but also with other experts and I think the sort of work they, that the CPA is doing whether it's at that level or us from a UK point of view uh, about as people have said bringing people with a common interest and a common set of challenges and helping them work through them and find solutions is uh, may seem very routine and very simple and quotidian or daily or routine, but actually makes an impact. Otherwise, as we say, this, these organisations would not still be thriving as indeed they are today. Um, why, why do they work? Uh, and why, if, one, if the Commonwealth didn't exist, might one be what, would be, what would we be taking from the design of these events and these organisations that make it work? I think despite how I've just posed the question, one answer to that is, is because they are there. We are inclined to use networks and systems and frameworks that are there. Uh, and I think one reason why, in our case, parliaments right across the Commonwealth, whether it's national or subnational, uh, get involved with the work is because they understand it. It's, an, it's a known network which works to them. And I don't think we should uh, underestimate the value of that establishment and the sort of I don't mean sunk cost, but I mean the effort that has gone into it, the structures that are there. Uh, we all know if you're creating startups, for, for example, the Diplomatic Academy, which Amitav mentioned, the energy of activation to start a new organization, a new network is really tough. So I don't think we should undervalue the sheer benefit of having a structure that is there and can work. The second reason of when it works is, and I think Indrajit used the phrase, a comfortable space. I was going to say a safe space. Relatively speaking, this is just my observed experience of members of Parliament and staff from Parliaments across the Commonwealth, is they find a Commonwealth space, a relatively safe one in which to operate. Uh, they, we see them, they say they feel they're able to have conversations, surface issues and challenges about their own Parliament and their own experiences that perhaps they would not feel as able to do in either a more formal uh, intergovernmental framework or a more uh, public and less discreet and less well-established forum. Uh, and that can be about uh, specific issues about their own parliaments or it might be about uh, shared challenges. I think it's also uh, one of the ways in which it can work is because of the breadth of expertise and the variety of expertise that the, the Commonwealth, with it being a, uh, a, a snapshot, a subset of the broader global, uh, the broader world, is that within the Commonwealth family you will find and can find uh, all sorts of variety of experience of what you may be trying to challenge, whether it's uh, in size or scale or scope or extent of development, whatever it might be, you will find from the, the curious mix that is the Commonwealth, you will probably find something which will be close enough in scope to your own experience that it will be a uh, credible place to be learning from and with and sharing with. So I think it's that uh, the, the available pool of expertise is actually uh, is very uh, well suited to many of these professional organizations or associations to be able to fish in, as you will. And when it works well, the final quality, I think, which makes it work as well as being established, it's a, it's a safe space, uh, it's got a pool of expertise, but it also can and should be uh, an organization, uh, a network of equals. Uh, in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, 
unlike some parts of the Commonwealth family, it is not just the, the national level. Uh, it's very much an organization where what you might call subnational or regional or state or provincial or whatever uh, parliaments can also play a full role. So when we are in Halifax, Nova Scotia for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Conference in uh, August this year, uh, delegations will be there in, in their own right from those uh, in the UK context devolved parliaments. So there will be representatives of Scotland who are there in their own right. There will be people from Guernsey who are there in their own right. There will be people from St Helena in their own right. There will be people from Ontario there in their own right. There will be people from the states of Nigeria or the um, states and territories of Australia, for example. I could go on. But it, and, and when they are there, while some delegations may be larger than others, they are there with a right, with a vote that is equal to others. So I think that, uh, in that sense, the equality of opportunity to be part of the event is key. We've already heard quite a lot about why it doesn't always work and why it's tough, so I will not uh, go on too long, I hope, on that side of things. I think for us, particularly with a UK-badged organisation that's also a Commonwealth organisation, the uh, historical tensions the, the mistrust, if something is, as I think Indrajit was, was mentioning, the risk of it with the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, if something looks too British, uh, uh, you quite quickly get into difficult territory. That said, a lot of people come to Westminster in the parliamentary context precisely because they want to learn about the UK context. So it, it's a, a balance we are very familiar with but actually the organisation as a whole needs to absolutely make sure that it does not look, sound, feel too British. Uh, and that is a constant tightrope. I don't I think I have a great solution to that, but it is very much a reality. Uh, I could say more about the Charter, but others have already spoken eloquently about it. Let me use the reference to the Charter as a way uh, into my uh, suggestions, building on uh, what I hope there are some examples of why, how the Commonwealth can work and some of the limitations of why it doesn't work as to what might actually we might do differently. And I'm, I confess I too hadn't really focused on the fact it was the 10th anniversary uh, of the Charter, but it strikes me that that's an opportunity for many things. Uh, and given the extraordinariness of the Charter in some ways, that could be a peg or a driver for two of the areas which I would suggest more could be done. One would be to develop in a more, uh, to develop the work that the Commonwealth has always done around election observation. It is a, it is a, a cliche to say that uh, democracy is not just about elections, but it's elections that tend to get the most focus in terms of a, a structured and sophisticated analysis and observation and missions to report. We all know that actually if you're looking at the health of democracy and the rule of law in a country, you have to look at so much else. And actually there is no structured way of doing that. So a suggestion would be trying to devise a way that in the same way that one accepts that election observation reasons are largely uh, the norm, not just across the Commonwealth, but more broadly, can there not be some extension of that so that there is a more consistent reporting mechanism of some kind which goes on between those sporadic and periodic events, which are not what democracy really is about. They are, of course, a key element of it. But the health of the democracy uh, could arguably use uh, uh, some of the same sophisticated methods as election observation, when it's done well, uh, uses. Uh, obviously, there will be quite a lot of barriers to that, but I put that out there as one thought. Uh, the other is, uh, is selfishly, uh, from a parliamentary point of view, how you bring in uh, the parliaments of the Commonwealth to do what they are supposed to do in their own nations, i.e. scrutinise the performance of their governments and the executive, and to do that at a cross-Commonwealth level. So the communique, which has been uh, referred to once today already, that sets out ambitious targets. Why not uh, invite the parliaments of the Commonwealth in some way to uh, be scrutinising the performance of the Commonwealth and its governments against the commitments they make in a regular and, uh, and structured way, in a way that one might expect select committees or uh, other processes in the various parliaments of the Commonwealth to do that. Again, that would not in one sense be complicated to do or to arrange, uh, and it would not on it, of itself 
ensure that the communicate commitments were met, but it might encourage uh, greater adherence to them. One might, for example, I was talking to a, uh, um, a committee chair in, in the House of Commons just this week who was speculating that why not uh, have a, a, a network of foreign affairs committees of the various parliaments of the Commonwealth who, again, could focus either on the, the communique as a whole or specific commitments that have been made uh, across the Commonwealth, uh, sorry, in the communique. So I think some practical ways of building on existing mechanisms that are there uh, so that we have uh, both a fuller sense of the health of democracy in the countries of the Commonwealth rather than just a snapshot at election time and a way that when uh, at Kigali or at any Chogham a whole range of commitments are made by our governments that actually then there is some regular serious scrutiny by elected representatives of whether those commitments are being met. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, uh, and thank you for your very specific and constructive ideas. Uh, when people talk about commonalities in the Commonwealth that are its strengths, I think the parliamentary tradition is very much singled out often as one of those commonalities. Not every Commonwealth <coughs> country has the same system of democracy, but I think the underlying system of, a, of an executive being held accountable to elected representatives of the people is a very important one that must not be lost sight of. John has also um, highlighted some of the rather episodic uh, bits of interest that are taken in aspects of democracy, one of them being elections. It has often been a complaint, and Matthew Newhouse will, will readily agree, that uh, we've had long debates about observing an election and then forgetting about that country until the next election. Uh, what happens in between, nobody is particularly bothered about. And you find that the observer group that goes there the next time around ends up making extremely similar recommendations to the ones that were made the last time. Likewise, uh, a communique is agreed at Chogham and uh, wait till the next Chogham. What processes are there in place, not just for the member governments who agreed that communique, but for the many other organizations that can reinforce implementation of that communique to periodically do a little audit of what has been done by their own government to implement the outcomes of that meeting. Um, I think we've had three extremely good statements uh, with lots of constructive suggestions. There is a wealth of experience in this room, knowledge, insight, um, Commonwealth experience, that dates back many years and in many fields. And uh, I believe there is a very impressive field of people online as well. So I think I'll first open the questions to, to this room, and I will be guided by Alex on uh, how to handle the online one. So do you have a? I do. I'm just going to take a microphone from the front to hand to the speaker yeah. and the audience so that those on Zoom can hear well. Okay. Right. We can take that one. Yeah, yeah this, is, this, is, this is from the now. Can I uh, request Matthew Newhouse first, please? Well, thank you very much, um, Amitav, and uh, thank you to the speakers. Fantastic to see Anne and John here, too. What a great occasion, Sue. Congratulations. And can I actually commend the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association? Because I'm actually on a holiday visit here for the first time in over two years with my daughter and her new partner from Australia who knows about the Commonwealth because as a young, still in his 20s man, he was brought here by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association hmm. on a visit. And that just underlines the sort of very effective work that's being done there. Two points I would like want to make. One is in regard to the issue of budget, uh, which is needed for the Commonwealth if it's, if it's going to do any of the things that it should be doing. And at this moment, as we know, values have come to the front of the whole debate internationally. And while I speak as currently serving Australian ambassador in the Netherlands, I speak in a, here in an entirely personal capacity and as a member of the round table. But in that work role too, values has come to the fore. I'm speaking on this uh, recently in the Netherlands. And it's a real debate in the world now between autocracy and democracies, essentially. And the Commonwealth stands very firmly 
all its membership under the Commonwealth Charter on the issues of values, freedom, and democracy. And I think that voice is ever more relevant. But that voice can't be heard without resources and many good points made by Indrigid about the development aspects. There needs to be a very frank conversation between the Commonwealth Secretariat um, and associated organizations like the Foundation, which is doing a great job under Anne's leadership, um, on what needs to be done for more resources to be forthcoming. And that frank conversation is not really happening, and I doubt it will happen at CHOC. So that's number one. We need, and groups like this, I think, can assist that. Because the one reason the Commonwealth uh, has survived is indeed the leadership role that the Secretariat has been able to pursue over the years. And I think we're grateful to the founders of the Secretariat. The second thing is to respond, I think, and um, it's a good suggestion on eminent persons, but Indra, um, Indrajit and Amitabh and I have been through many eminent persons groups over our years. I'm not sure it's actually an eminent persons group we need. We do need some sort of dialogue, but I think it actually needs to involve more people from your organization. It needs to be a people's discussion where there's much more investment. Because what has happened in the past with eminent persons is often there are people not so deeply connected with the Commonwealth, come up with great suggestions, but they're not implemented. We need something that is a little more, shall I say, elaborate than an eminent persons group and has more investment from the whole membership of the Commonwealth, from organizations here. We have to give some thought to that, but I think this group, Sue and her team, can help with that. And I think your foundation can help with that. So it's not something so disconnected as eminent persons tend to be, but something that really involves the people of the Commonwealth. And I'd like to thank John for reminding us the essential role of parliaments, including sub-national parliaments in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, I'm going to go around the number of people who've asked for the floor in this room. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left for this session. We could probably go a few minutes past, but please uh, keep your comments as focused as and short as possible. Uh, Mark Robinson. Well, first of all, thank you to our speakers for three wonderful contributions. Uh, I've worked closely uh, with the Foundation. I've worked ten, ten, nearly 10 years with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association when I was in Parliament. And as for Indigit, well, we started together when he was a schoolboy and a wonderful ex-spin bowler he was at Harrow School. But now let's, let's come back to the reality. I chair a very small Commonwealth organisation and um, I think my board started to think that I was just going insane and was going to destroy it. Because before we were struck by COVID, I persuaded them to take the organization, to close the office and take the organization virtual. And I spent all of lockdown making it work. And my goodness, does it now work? We have board meetings, uh, both virtual and face-to-face -face at the National Liberal Club. And we have 20 to 25 people tuning in from all around the Commonwealth. At COP26, I was privileged to be allowed to lead a delegation of um, seven people uh, during uh, that conference. And through Waikato University in New Zealand, we had sent daily reports that went to every nook and cranny uh, of the Pacific. Uh, I'm pleased now that we've got two young people who are being sponsored, one from India, uh, one from Ghana, to the Commonwealth People's Forum. They're both under 30. We've got one other uh, who is older, but a, a great expert in, in mangroves. And uh, climate change is at the top of our agenda, but you've got to be focused. And we are focused on the problems affecting the 32 small states of the Commonwealth, rising sea levels, plastic uh, in the oceans. And specifically, and we've done projects on this, restoring mangroves, protecting mangroves, which uh, along with the um, citizen vice, not citizen vice, doesn't matter, just saying, um, we've got projects going, they've got projects going, um, 
and uh, that you know that is fantastic. So my question to our three panelists is: Are we doing enough uh, for the small state of the Commonwealth? And uh, how do we involve them even more? Because I've heard it said in many quarters, the thing about the Commonwealth for the small states is it takes an interest in us. And very often we go to larger international meetings and we find it very hard even to get a word in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, if the panelists don't mind, I'm just going to take a few more comments and we will find some time at the end to address as many of the questions that arise as possible. Um, I'm going to go to Karen Brewer next and come back to you, Harry. Thank you very much, Shabataf, and thank you very much um, for all the contributions. Let me echo what John says in John said about parliamentarians. We have the same issues, we have the same considerations, and um, we are what you said about Parliament is as valid for the judiciary across the Commonwealth, except perhaps we don't have as much money as you do, <laughs> and resources in the judiciary are declining because of the problems um, with the lack of democracy and democratic values uh, at the moment. Um, we, whilst Anne, I understand you want an eminent persons group, I, I do agree with Matthew. Oh, I'm already persuaded. Um, I, I do agree with Matthew that, um, that it is, a, uh, it is um, a problem. What would be useful is some of the suggestions made by the last eminent persons group, such as the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Rule of Law, um, could be re resurrected and some of the, 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 the things that were included, that were discarded um, by um, governments, could be resurrected and I think we should be looking at those type of things. Um, and for me, the Charter is not an aspirational document, it's a, it's a road map, like the Latimer House principles, like the Latimer House guidelines. And incidentally, next year is the 25th anniversary of the Commonwealth Latimer House um, guidelines on parliamentary supremacy and judicial independence, and the 20th anniversary of the Commonwealth Latimer House principles uh, or, that came out of the guidelines. So I think we've got three big events next year uh, to celebrate. But what we really need is to find ways of implementing this, a roadmap, a plan of action based on the, the, the charter. I think that's something that maybe we could look at uh, in the future uh, as part of the, the process uh, that Matthew suggested. And maybe strengthening CMAG again, I know it's, uh, it's a mantra that we've all had in, over the years. Um, I, and in 2008, uh, at the two, uh, in the wings of the law ministers in, uh, in, in Edinburgh, we suggested a standing committee um, of accredited organizations or civil society organizations that were involved in the democratic um, principles and advancing the values to be advising the CMAG uh, process. Uh, that hasn't happened so far. We're still wanting the implementation in that sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, and I think it's probably useful for me to also remind that we do have a session on values. Uh, we do have a session on programs. And some of the comments that have been made um, would be very relevant there. And it would be useful to bring it up for discussion with the panels there. Arif Samad. Yes, I just want to make a question in the context of an organisation uh, still on the border. There's been called a Commonwealth Network in its, for the whole of its 20 year history, which is the Commonwealth Businessmen's Network. When it was established by the Secretariat and the private sector body for the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Business Council, it was always envisioned to be something that could have an impact on, on, on real things. So certainly it's work on bringing women um, to ministerial meetings from a business background in terms of gender responsive policy, um, trade, um, that's all been, and the gender digital, by that's all been positive. But I think my question is really around resourcing is, you know, the argument about resourcing is fine, but actually there's a bigger question, which we haven't really addressed sufficiently here, which is how can networks be effective if you have institutional ineffectiveness and inertia in Marlborough House, you know? 
And you know, you can't have a situation where you have Commonwealth Secretariat convening meetings when they're excluding the participation of accredited organisations who have a specific mandate for working in, in the very area of women's economic development. <coughs> You can't have an organization that's ineffective if it's not following up on agreed policies. The Nairobi Women's Affairs Ministerial meeting, groundbreaking policy on gender mainstreaming, but zero follow through in terms of implementation across different parts of the Secretariat in terms of its work. And equally, you can't have a situation where a Commonwealth Secretariat, still after 12 or 15 months, doesn't have a head of gender. It's a joke. And that is actually a real issue if you're talking about an effective collaboration between networks and the Secretariat, that is so important. So my question is, networks, yes, but institutional ineffectiveness can be a barrier, and we need to address that as well. What are the thoughts? Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Arif. Uh, I'll come there in a moment. Uh, Guy, Guy Hewitt. Uh, Good morning, all. Um, I want to pick up on this issue of networking. And I want to commend the organizers for bringing the foundation, the CPA, and someone, a former member of the Secretariat, together because they represent three significant strands in the Commonwealth. Um, the CPA, because of its, its non -known, being known around the Commonwealth because of its work with um, parliamentarians, the foundation, trying to bring together non-state actors and someone, a former member and from the secretary and a former colleague who, which represents, because of the relationship with heads, really the Commonwealth's leading organization. But like with all families, and we call it a family of nations, a um, family of organizations, there's a power relationship. And there is a serious problem in the Commonwealth in the imbalance and the misuse of power between organizations within the network. And when we talk about what is the problem with the networking, and with the greatest of respect to my former colleagues at the Secretariat, we have to accept the Commonwealth Secretariat, like many political politicians and political organizations, speaks about inclusiveness, and it speaks about the people when it needs to and it's convenient. But there has been inadequate action by the Commonwealth Secretariat to prove that it has been willing to tangibly support the member organizations to really make this Commonwealth network viable. And I say that having tried to fight going into the last summit to ensure that the Commonwealth associations got a voice and got recognized, and it didn't happen. So I say that when we are talking about networking, we have to deal with the elephant in the room, which is the Commonwealth Secretariat that does not treat its brother and sister organizations as equal partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy, for your comments, and uh, we look forward to your participation in the next session as well, where you are a speaker. May I turn uh, this way, John, John, John Davis? I'm sorry, David Jones, I think you've had a touch there. David Jones. Oh, in, in families, we always confuse the names, so. <laughs> um, just, just a brief comment. Um, I'm David Jones from the Commonwealth Organization for Social Work. Um, just by way of um, uh, information, um, our budget um, bank balance is 800 pounds at the moment. Um, our total activity is based on voluntary commitment. And we have a board that stretches from Malaysia all the way through um, Africa, through to Barbados, as well as Canada, Australia, and so on. And um, it always amazes me, um, I'm talking about the sort of energy that, that, and, and interest that people have. And when we were pushed to form in 1994, the UK um, Association of Social Work had said, why would we be interested? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we were persuaded by colleagues in Africa and Asia who said, yeah, that we've got some common things, and we should at least get on with it. We've got to keep it in proportion. It's not the main um, an international organization but for social workers. We don't have lots of money, um, but we need to be there. And there is energy to do it and commitment to it. 
Um, but I pick up the point that Guy um, has just made, and perhaps to say, um, going with Anne's um, emphasis on the, the positive and the, and the, uh, the optimistic, um, the optimisms um, get things done. There is a Secretariat Review, VJ's um, um, organising that at the moment. Um, there is actually, any, you wouldn't know necessarily, but an incredible energy among the accredited organisations at the moment. Through IFCO, the Independent Forum of Commonwealth Organisations, as many people come to those meetings as come to the Secretary General's meetings. And they are, and a number of us are in this room, and we're gradually forming clusters and groups that are taking forward issues. Arif mentioned it as well. Um, Nicholas has done fantastic work as, in holding it together. But it's all done on purely, totally voluntary commitment. And that is not sustainable. If we're really serious about network making it work, of course, some of the organisations, including CPA, have got capacity. And that's why it's good for us as a small organisation to network enthusiastically with people piggyback on other people's, but that's what a communal family does in a way, and we'd be very grateful for Stephen's support and um, other things. So I suppose my message in, in, in the network discussion um, is that there is energy there, there is an enthusiasm, there's a willingness to work and do stuff. We've done recently some webinars with the Institute here. We've got a, a board member from Barbados who's um, very involved with, with us. Um, and um, but, but, but that needs something more. And my final point is, um, VJ and Anand have taken the foundation very much to focus on civil society in country. And that, that's where the real groundwork is and it needs to be. But somehow connecting that a bit more effectively with some of the voice of accredited organisations would, I think, enable us to be even more powerful in a Chogham setting and elsewhere. Um, because um, if we can both come out with common statements and shared statements, it take, partnerships always take energy and time. But if we were able to do that, we've got the good ground on, on the ground voices and other things, um, as well as the accredited organisations, then and I think there would be synergy. There's no doubt there would be. Um, it gives us even more powerful voices. So things to work on for the future, and, but optimistically. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Um, I need to be conscious of time, and I need to give uh, our panelists time to react and respond to some of the comments that have been made. So unless there are any particular questions online that we can't address later, I'm going to request our panelists in the same order in which they spoke to please uh, comment. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much uh, to our chair and to fellow speakers. and. Uh, those who contributed. So I've just got a couple of very quick comments that have uh, come from what just came from the floor. I think, yeah, absolutely, Matthew, for, for me, the idea, like the eminent persons group is kind of an uh, umbrella title for some kind of coming together of people who care about the Commonwealth to figure out what its purpose needs to be going forward and how that's actually going to be made real. Um, I worry that there, there is the fundamental problem of not just the, um, <laughs> the yeah, where how power operates within the Commonwealth, but also where interests align and don't align. So if I look around here, um, it's wonderful to have one or two uh, member state officials here, but there's not too many of them. Uh, there's not much, you know, hopefully three quarters of the secretariat is online, uh, not much in the room. So we have to think about this. We, you know, we have the People's Forum where the people come together. And I think one of the things we've tried to do at the foundation over the last couple of years is really bring the people into the conversation about the future of the Commonwealth. And that's interestingly where we got the hundreds and thousands of, of people talking about um, what they want from their Commonwealth. We did something on Commonwealth Day that got half a million uh, people engaged in less than 24 hours. So the interest is there, but how do we bring that to the member states uh, that still exercise the power uh, and still are really in the driving seat when it, as they, they should be? about the future of the Commonwealth, how do we align these up and how do we bring the Secretariat and other intergovernmental pillars of the Commonwealth 
uh, right into this as well. So I don't mind what it's called, but I think we've got to do something. And I think we have to do it. The, you know, the, the Charter, we're going to do a lot around the anniversary of the Charter. We're going to be shouting the Charter from the rooftops, uh, as we have been. Uh, Latimer House principals open our annual report, which is coming out next week, an extract from that. So we are absolutely determined to make the ideals and the principles of the Commonwealth Central to every single thing that the Foundation will ever, ever do. And that's, you know, that's our way of trying to contribute to this. You know, we experience, Guy, we experience the power differential firsthand, let me, uh, let me tell you, without going into too much detail. So there... <laughs> Uh, there, yeah, yeah. I won't say any more about that. But that's, okay. yeah, that's an ongoing struggle, and it's an ongoing struggle to remind our member states, to remind the rest of the Commonwealth that this organisation, this is the thing that makes it different. That it's not just a club of states, but it's the idea of the Commonwealth is an idea about the people. This thing being two-sided. We have. We have a coin that has the people on one side and the member states on the other. How do we how do we make that real? How do we make it meaningful? How do we make it that golden thread that pulls through the future of the Commonwealth? Um, lots of other things to say, but I think there's too many other people who've got uh, yeah important things to say. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Anne. And there'll be other opportunities uh, in the other sessions and uh, hopefully in the coffee breaks and the lunch breaks and the tea breaks for conversations to continue. Uh, Indrajit, if you're still with us on Zoom, uh, you have a, your chance to react to some of the comments yeah. made. After, I've just got a couple of things to say. I, I think uh, the, the um, discussion has again reinforced the importance of resources. Um, yeah. The other, other point is, I think it is always, uh, you know, the relationship between the Secretariat and the, and the rich uh, variety of Commonwealth associations that are part of the family. That relationship has, has always had its share of challenges. Um, and I suspect part of it, again, could arise uh, from uh, constrained resources. But one way of perhaps trying to address that is, is to really brand the Commonwealth as a network of networks. You know, that, that's what it essentially is. Uh, and if all of us can think of the Commonwealth as a network of networks, then hopefully um, it will become easier to um, manage the relationship between the intergovernmental Commonwealth uh, and, and the rest of, rest of the family. Uh, finally, I, I think I saw um, uh, something come up uh, in the chat box, uh, and that's young people. Uh, I think Matthew said that uh, there is a, a clash of values that, uh, that is taking place around the world, and values have become more important. Certainly, um, drawing on the experience of my own country, Sri Lanka, right now, it is young people who are, who are basically uh, pushing back uh, in terms of espousing the values that the Commonwealth stands for. Uh, and uh, we, th this is something we've talked about for years, of, of how to basically engage young people more effectively. Uh, it's probably becoming even, even more important now uh, because the, the young people with the modern communications technology are exposed to so much more and have far more open minds and are far uh, are far more uh, receptive of inclusivity um, and diversity. Uh, and so I, I think that needs to be tapped into. Uh, this is what we've been saying for many years, but I think we need to keep working hard to make sure we do better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Indrajit. Uh, and uh, finally, I'll give the microphone back to John for his final comments. Thank you, Amit. I really want the last word because others have slightly more profound things to say, but let me just try and address some of the, what we've heard and been asked. Uh, I, my solution to uh, yeah, the challenges of dealing or working with the Commonwealth Secretary is uh, I'm at yet another further removed from it, being just the UK part of CPA. So um, in reality, I, perhaps surprisingly, I don't have a lot to do with the Commonwealth Secretary, so I don't feel a uh, able to say very much about it, as many of you can eloquently. 
What I would say is that any organisation which is clearly under-resourced is, is, has one hand tied behind its back. Uh, now then how well it is led, run, whether it fit, fulfills its purpose is another thing. But actually I think you have to remember in the end that actually without resource uh, it, is, it is hamstrung and that does come back to the member states absolutely largely. It's going to come back to member states. Resources, yes, we are lucky as CPA UK, we get uh, consistent funding from the UK Parliament, which doesn't have to give us money, it gives us a grant each year to do our work as CPA UK, which is fundamental to most of our work. Otherwise, it, we are a membership organisation, and it's a subscription organisation of parliaments across the, across the Commonwealth. Uh, and that has been tough, particularly in the last couple of years. It is genuinely tough for quite a lot of member parliaments to find even their sort of appropriately sized uh, contributions and it is something which I know that CPA Secretariat overall uh, is very conscious that especially for smaller states but not necessarily small ones actually uh, making sure that they're not uh, accidentally deprived of the benefits of membership of CPA by shorter term uh, difficulties in paying and that can be whether it's uh, direct effects of COVID or whatever it might be. Uh, so it is something that's conscious, particularly small states. Mark Robinson's question about small states. I mean, the CPA has a separate network or a network within it of small branches, which is uh, all now populations under a million. So that's actually quite a significant number. So there is a whole work stream, particularly around climate, and related to that. And just finally, uh, on the end of persons group, I mean, th there's interesting experimenting right across the Commonwealth and beyond around citizens' assemblies and the like at the moment. Uh, and uh, again, there are various models of doing that, but I wonder whether uh, it's that kind of model or one of those models, particularly involving younger people, as, as Indrajit was saying, might actually be uh, the way to do some of what, uh, what, what Anne was saying, that to get some of that strategic, long-term and ambitious and imaginative and positive and optimistic thinking so that we are on the right path uh, for that 10-year anniversary and 10-year timeline that you, you were talking about. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for their comments. I'd like to thank the audience for the participation in this, in this discussion. Um, our panelists have responded to some of the comments that have been made. But I hear a creed occur here. The networks are there, and the network of networks is there. But it is not functioning to full potential. And there is a need to energize it. Uh, there is clearly a, a leadership kick that needs to be given to those networks to make them function better. Inclusivity, balance, these are some of the buzzwords that have been used here that are really quite important. But I believe that this has been a, a good kickoff to our discussion and I look forward to the further sessions and I'm sure you're all looking forward to coffee now. So thank you very much.